Okay, so this is um, this is a, a survey lecture in that I'm I'm reviewing a couple of other approaches about uh, vehicle motion planning other than the attractive dynamics approach, which we discussed in some depth previously. Um, and the goal is sort of twofold. On the one hand, some conceptual clarifications on 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 how to classify that and some pointing at the literature is a large literature on that and, and, then, and then I wanted to discuss a few examples in more detail not in very much detail but some detail primarily the potential field approach which you already encountered when you did the uh, reading for uh, exercise I don't remember it's two or three when when you read the Fajan Warren paper that was uh, I, I'll cite from that again um, yeah that's the topic. So let me remind you. So we're talking about motion planning, path planning in for vehicles. So in two D in, in the plane, um, and it's a problem in the sense that there is some structure in the world, and so motion planning really means uh, constraint satisfaction. You want to reach a target, you want to avoid collisions. Sometimes you might have other constraints, like you want to maybe go along a particular path, pass by particular places. Very often. In vehicle, yeah, for instance, if you if you're a car, you might want to stay on the road, or you might have a, a certain a whole sequence of steps that you have to go through, like to deliver someone or pick up something along the road and so on. And I also want to point out that uh, about the physical nature of what is being controlled, the orientation of the vehicle might play a role. So just a very brief point. This a lot of what I'm teaching to today is really just so you know the terms and you are aware of a field, but I'm not reviewing these fields in detail. <clears throat> so one term that you will see when you look up motion planning is non-holonomic constraints. And I wanna make you aware of that issue. <clears throat> so you, you might, uh, so let's make, first make clear that the kind of uh, vehicles we've been looking at, these circular robots uh, clearly can achieve a position in the plane by driving there and an orientation in the plane, for instance, by rotating on the spot. And that is, uh, that means it has, uh, they have three degrees of freedom, two translational ones and uh, one orientation ones, but they really have only two actuated degrees of freedom. They have only two motors. And so what they do is um, they um, always move uh, on a, a path, then so so if they're positioned in a particular way, they cannot move sideways, right? They can at a moment in time they only can move forward, although the forward velocity uh, can be zero, and then the the uh, curvature of the path will be sh show up in turning on the spot. So this discrepancy between having uh, being able to achieve freely uh, something in a higher dimensional space than the space that you actually have. Uh, have under direct control, that's called non having satisfying non holonomic constraints. So for these uh, robots that we discussed, it's a, it's a rather simple issue. So we haven't really dealt with that in any deep or interesting way. Uh, it's also not a topic of my course, just want to make you aware of that. You could uh, maybe just register that in general, it's a much more complicated issue in general. I mean by that, um, under more general conditions, for instance, a car, this would be a car, uh, would have a very similar um, problem theoretically. That is, you have essentially two actuators, the steering wheel and the gas pedal, let's say. Uh, so they uh, enable you to uh, affect the turning rate, the rotation, uh, and the forward velocity of the vehicle. But the vehicle can also, in principle, take on any position and any orientation in the world. Um, but because you cannot rotate on the spot, achieving that is actually more complicated. That is, it requires sometimes a particular history of control uh, commands. And so that's a whole field of study of how to do that well. Uh, all of you are familiar with that when you park a car, right? That, because there you actually do need to position the car and orient the car while still satisfying constraint, like not colliding with the other cars that uh, are in front and behind. And as you may remember, that's not always so easy. Uh, it's also not always invertible. That is uh, getting in and getting out is not actually equivalent. Uh, 
uh, and this is actually an active field, for instance, for autonomous parking of how to get vehicles to um, based on some environmental uh, uh, estimate to do this automatically. Uh, these algorithms have been worked out very well. There are autonomous parkers who, who are better than human, actually. The problem is for the human to get out of the parking spot. Um, check in here. Intuitively speaking, it means that what to achieve the position in the 3D world, you have to take um, all three uh, goals into account uh, for a finite time interval. You have to plan for that interval. While in the case that we studied, you can, for instance, just first achieve position and then achieve orientation. And that would the strategy of achieving orientation would be the same independent of the position, right? You just rotate on the spot would be always a, a stereotypical procedure. So these three things are independent and therefore you don't have to uh, worry about the orientation as you plan the translation. You can just try to uh, get to a particular position and for that you use orientation as well, right? And then correct the orientation. Well, in general, what will have we, what uh, this will mean is that when you position the car, you cannot use orientation freely. You also have to already take into account for your orientation the fact that later you will have to orient, orient it in a particular way. And so, uh, remind you, what we're talking about today is planning. And so this planning uh, presupposes that we know something ab about the environment, which we know because we have sensors about the environment, this being autonomous robotics. And then we're also assuming that when we have this plan, we can realize the plan. In the examples I look at, I just assume that the, the uh, uh, trajectories of behavioral variables that are generated uh, can be tracked by the actual control system to do that. And uh, that control actually typically entails some form of feedback that is that you estimate what actually happened and keep that uh, discrepancy minimal. And uh, also in this approach to planning, you assume that these things are done and work so that in planning, you don't have to deal with that. In the nervous systems, those who've listened to the winter semester now, you may know that organisms actually don't co separate control and planning in this clean way. Uh, they do what is called online updating, that is they replan while they're acting. And so part of their control is replanning. And uh, which, which is interesting because you have redundancy uh, as well. And uh, they're also um, organizing the sensing and the representation of the environment based on what they're currently planning. So you are looking for things, looking for constraints uh, as an active process rather than having some world representation and planning. So this uh, possibility to isolate planning is uh, a result of the conceptual organization of autonomous robotic architectures and when one uses these kind of concepts to study how humans behave or animals behave then um, these ideas need some revision that's an interesting topic for our own research and I will be referring a little bit to that in the part when I talk about uh, manipulator movements you know arm movements directed at objects it's in that domain that these effects are well known good so um, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about path planning. So it's this in a layer, given the environment, generating these time courses of planning variables, behavior variables. And, um, um, and I do this here only for the 2D problem, but I'll point to how this can be do also done more generally in more abstract spaces. Now, two concepts or two pairs of concepts that you will see in this literature. One is local versus global planning. Uh, and that reflects essentially how strong your assumptions are about what you know about the environment. I already loosely used those terms when I showed you these robotic, uh, these movies about the vehicle uh, navigating. So local uh, would mean that there is information about the environment that is um, limited in spatial extent. It's very typically thought of as being uh, sensory information that is available to the vehicle from the position where it currently is. So the sensors deliver some information about the environment uh, so that you do not have to track that information across multiple um, uh, measurements that you take as the vehicle moves. Uh, while global, you would assume that the vehicle essentially has a map of the environment uh, so that it uh, can uh, 
both in the forward sense, for instance, can anticipate where it will end up when it does certain motor commands. And uh, that would mean, for instance, that it can also take into account the fact that there might be uh, certain blockages, for instance, that do not enable reaching the goal, the target along certain paths, uh, and take that into account in its planning, while in the local approach, information like that isn't available. So this is a, an important difference for uh, vehicle motion because uh, you know vehicles move with their sensors through the environment and uh, therefore um, they have uh, they do not have access to all the information for the environment that they need to uh, get to the target because the target might not even be visible or not you know, visible to its sensors and therefore also the path to the target might not be visible to its sensors and um, so so that local planning uh, is you know, not equivalent to global planning. Uh, if you, you know, for instance, if you have a bird's eyes view of a 2D terrain and you're uh, you know, controlling remotely some actuator there, then you would have that access. You know, there would be no difference between local and global. So for vehicles, it's important. And the other way around, if you have sensors and want to uh, extract from these sensors global information, you have to solve essentially the SLAM problem, self-localization and map formation problem. That is, you have to then interpret the sensor information as being information about a world in which you have to know where you are to correctly enter the information about the world. We'll briefly uh, connect to that question in, in a moment. Uh, yes, uh, somebody is asking if a system can have both local and global planning. In fact, it's actually very typical. And I'll show you examples in a little while where there is a local planner that's very typical. You have a local planner based on current sense information that's often called reactive. I'll give you examples of that. And um, at the same time, you might have a global planner working on top. And so sometimes the global planner sort of makes strategic decisions about certain routes to take among multiple routes. And then the uh, local planner is used sort of for the details of the detailed steering. Um, there's a question, uh, if there's a natural way to connect the dynamics approach to forming a map. Yes, there is. Uh, in fact, this is a very interesting topic uh, that might be worthwhile lecturing about, even though it's a little bit complicated. Um, I could say that there is a, a neurally inspired approach to the SLAM problem. Uh, one variant of that is called rat slam, and that really refers to rats, because in, in uh, the uh, spatial navigational behavior has been studied a lot in rats, you know, just uh, as a lab animal. And we know that the hippocampus and it's an orinal cortex, which is uh, feeding that uh, subcortical structure are uh, neurally involved in spatial orientation and sort of building cognitive maps that is um, sort of predicting how uh, targets can be reached. And so RATSLAM is a um, sort of a technical caricature of that system that has actually really been used to solve SLAM problems for uh, the cars, for vehicles. It's used in, in a technical sense by some people. This is a group in Australia who developed that. And these um, the neurophysiology of this mechanism in the RATSLAM uh, some based on what is called uh, place fields, neurons that have certain tuning properties to the location of the animal in the world and the orientation of the animal in the world. It's actually very closely allied to dynamical thinking. These people don't use exactly the same jargon, but what they do is essentially have peaks of population activation as I'm discussing in the winter semester, which uses you know, the dynamics approach. And they... Um, use these peaks to estimate where they are. So the motor commands are, are updating these peaks and they are tracking um, the, uh, you know, the, the estimates so that the vehicle, I mean, the, the organism knows, you know, neurally represents where it is all the time by sitting in an attractor that then slowly moves with sensor information. Um, so there's a detailed relationship. It goes beyond just the attractor dynamics as I explained it, it needs the neural representation of where you are. Uh, and we made a, a model many years ago that is uh, not yet using neural fields called, uh, it's by a student of mine called Steinhage that actually demonstrates how the attack dynamics approach in the sense I, I showed you here, plus a neural representation of eco position estimation 
can um, solve the slam problem. Uh, again, it's a little more complicated. It's actually quite a lot more complicated than anything I'm discussing in the lecture. So there's a connection to that. The way the slam uh, problem is usually solved when you don't use the analogy of a system is uh, uses uh, probabilistic concepts, which I'm not teaching in this course. Maybe a mistake. This is a very important area. Uh, so it represents um, distributions of, you know, of probability uh, the densities uh, that estimate where you are and uh, you know, the se sensor information about where you are, what this probability is. Uh, and, and that is very successful in the sense it can um, solve this problem with only limited sensor information or, or, or low level sensor information, mostly distance sensors that are better than the ones I showed you, like laser range finders, but still just a distance sensor, for instance, not a complete vision sensor. Um, but um, the downside of that is that uh, you actually really have to store and compute on a lot of information. Essentially, all the sensory estimates that you use along the way you will be entered into this probabilistic uh, framework, uh, which is an argument why animals might not do that. In fact, there's very strong arguments that animals don't do that. Um, but that's an approach that's very successful right now because it's not really... Uh, it, it's, it's possible with the current uh, computational resources to solve that problem. And uh, this is a, a very mathematically well-developed approach. And so, on. so a lot of the autonomous vehicle um, uh, demonstrations have used some form of that, of the probabilistic solution to the SLAM problem. So it's a bit of a debate whether the SLAM problem is still an open problem or not, because there are some solutions that in some cases work very well. But there are some open uh, frontiers as well. Okay, there was local versus global uh, planning. Uh, and it's sort of related is this reactive versus um, real planning. So reactive would be more like uh, control, like planning when you uh, plan on the fly in response to sensor input. So that would be certainly only possible for a local approach uh, versus whether you plan the entire action. So a lot of the approach, like the dynamic system approach, is reactive in the sense that it, at, at every moment in time, it just generates a new value for your desired uh, kinematic state. Um, and it will, that value will then you know, change in time as you, as you go, and it will depend on the sensor information you get. Um, it will not create a whole time series that anticipates the values you will have in the future, right? It will generate these future values only at the time when you're there. And that's how it can depend on current sensor info, uh, input. So it's clear that a um, something that is, goes beyond reactive that generates entire time series has to have some access to global information. Right? So these two concepts are, uh, pairs of concepts are sort of in a subtle way related. And so in, uh, here, to, uh, to two other pairs of contrasts. And so in the classical literature, people were talking about exact approaches. And from that point of view, all the others are then called heuristic approaches. And exact approaches are approaches that within you know, the, the framework established by them, they guarantee that the paths they generate will fulfill the constraints. And they guarantee, uh, moreover, that when there is a path that they will find it. Uh, so you can imagine that that really requires mathematical formalization of the constraints and a formalization of the problem of pathfinding that lends itself to such proof, mathematical proof. And there was a lot of effort going into uh, cases of that nature. Uh, just checking a question here. Uh, well, better, somebody's asking if exact is better. Well, uh, that depends on your, I mean, if one can always do that, that would be certainly attractive, right? Because you could guarantee the constraint violation or uh, non-violation, the achievement of the constraints. So one of the constraints is to go through the target, right? So that would be guaranteeing that you can find a solution if there is one. The downside of that is that it uh, needs a lot of assumptions. So no real practical approach ever is exact because the assumptions about a complete understanding of the world, of the environment, 
is not uh, really realizable or only approximately realizable because any kind of information you have about a map would be error prone. But there are degrees to which uh, uncertainty about the world matter. Um, so pretty much one can say that there are a few mathematical proofs for certain kinds of worlds. For instance, a uh, typical domain is polygonal um, boundaries that indicate the surfaces with which you could collide and a uh, simple assumption about like a convex um, uh, vehicle, then some cases where you can actually uh, create an exact approach. The exact approach is often uh, mathematically proven, but not really easy to compute numerically, um, requiring very extensive um, uh, modeling uh, simulation. Um, so, so these are the, the more exotic cases where you can really do that. In, in all the other cases, you don't guarantee the fulfillment. You just say it's common or uh, easy. Uh, you know, it's it's likely to uh, work, and uh, it's not even an exact mathematical characterization of what likely means. It's an empirical issue of how often there are constraint violations, and so one could say almost all implemented approaches are heuristic and the ones I will be discussing here are all heuristic. Um, uh, okay, about, um, so I, I, I can say, say because the potential field approach I will be discussing is a heuristic approach, but there is an exact version of it. So which, uh, you know, again, idealizes the environment. So uh, in the uh, potential field approach, I, I can refer back to that when I do the um, a potential field approach. Um, yeah, exactly. Heuristic just means that it's not exact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it doesn't mean much, right? Um, so, for instance, uh, when you're in potential field, I can already say that you're essentially going downhill. You know, create a potential, and then you're going downhill. And then we'll see that it doesn't always guarantee constraint satisfaction. And uh, for instance, you, you might violate constraint satisfaction in the sense that there are um, minima that you end up in, that you go to, that are not the target. And so one version to make that exact is to create a, a way to compute the potential that makes sure that the only minima are where the target is and where obstacles are, the maxima obstacles, minima uh, targets. And it turns out that then that, so there is an equation for that. So you can find out which potential field will have that property given that you know the constraints. Uh, for instance, one version that's a Poisson equation. And then it turns out that the Poisson equation is kind of hard to solve numerically. I mean, so theoretically you can write it down and, and you can say it has a solution fulfills the constraints but it's uh, difficult to solve numerically and um, it has the, uh, the the difficulty is made more uh, painful by the fact that when information about the environment changes you have to recompute that equation every time and uh, so that approach was called the navigation function approach which i didn't want to present here um, is not really ever used in practice because it's just too computationally demanding and the advantages it delivers is negligible. The main, the, main, the main difficulty in many of these cases is to have good sense of information about the environment. But it plays a big role because planning, as a, I, I'll cite the uh, textbook in a moment, and you see there's a little, if you look that up online, you see there's a lot of work on that. And so classically, this has defined just a, a, you know, a field in which you can prove theorems and establish certain approaches. So it's more a, a tool to develop the theory than something that you then do practically. And then people take some of these approaches and implement them and they become heuristic because of the uh, uncertainty about the environment. Yeah, and then <clears throat> there's a difference between uh, continuous versus discrete planning and uh, by that I mean, is the state space continuous or discrete? Uh, so we, um, in this path planning case, because we're really thinking about a continuous state space, that is you have continuously many positions, velocities, orientations, and so on. Uh, in other cases, people uh, discretize the state space. These are called grid state spaces and really only do the planning on the grid. And that's, for instance, very common in approaches that use reinforcement learning in some form because of the um, nature of the, uh, these processes. They, they uh, essentially have to look at all kinds of combination of motor actions. And if you had continuously many, that would be 
a function of continuously many arguments will be difficult to do. And so they make it a function of finitely many arguments by the discrete space. Another variant of that is to have a graph like state structure so that you have diff discrete um, different actions that you can take, but they have some kind of dependency on each other. So sub actions of actions and so on. And then you plan on a graph like that. So it's just to clarify, I mean, you, you will see that there are different literatures on these different uh, areas. <clears throat> so um, I refer to this difference uh, in the introductory lecture, I believe, if I remember correctly, where I pointed out that the a lot of the classical concepts are based on this sense plan act architectures. So where the sensing would lead to a world model on based on which you can can plan and act. And so this is the framework and within which one could talk about exact approaches at all, because they can define what, what that means by defining the model. And uh, where you can talk about global information. Um, and um, what else did I have? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, <clears throat> while the behavior-based approach, um, in which you have you know, elementary behaviors that are somehow organized relative to each other. You can see that by its very nature invites uh, approaches that are reactive, therefore very likely uh, based on local information and also uh, typically a, a heuristic in nature because you, you actually, the different behaviors have different domains. It's difficult to even to describe in which shared domain there would be an exact solution. And so you, one can really say the more reactive, local, uh, heuristic approaches are, the closer they are often to these behavior-based. And one can definitely say all the mathematically elaborate, exact approaches rely on the sense plan act uh, architecture. And so you have uh, combinations. Somebody asked that earlier. You have people who have this sort of planning. In fact, I'll close the lecture today by just pointing to this fact that there is deliberate planning that takes this uh, framework where, where within this uh, representational level, you might even do complex long-term planning. And then they have, uh, in addition, a behavior-based local reflective, you know, uh, reactive planner that just, just to find detail, the local steering. And therefore it, it uh, reduces the level at detail at which the world model has to be realistic it can be a more qualitative kind of model and you figure out the details so to not uh, strike the wall as you turn a uh, bend you know then you can use the sensors to do that fine tuning of your plan but the plan just says you know like take a left here this sort of idea okay so that that was sort of a conceptual survey i wanted to give um, I wanted to take you through, really, I'm, I'm really only taking you here through potential field approach, and this is a variant of it, and briefly through the Leibniz approach. First, I wanted to just show a few pictures about the classical formulation of planning, uh, and I'll end up by pointing to deliberate planning, as I mentioned. And so uh, if, you, if you look at uh, robot motion planning, you will find the name Latombe, who is of the famous originator of a lot of the work you wrote in the textbook. It's a very good textbook on that. Uh, there's also a very good review that is, I think, online available by Laval. Uh, it's a 2006 version from which I took some pictures in this. I think a new edition from 2010. You know, like several hundred pages books, both of those. Um, and I can say, so, so I'm just saying it's a large literature. There's a lot of different approaches there. And so very typically in these classical motion planning uh, approaches, uh, classical because they're based on sense plan act and because they make idealizations of the world representation that allow them planning. So very typical is that the constraints are uh, sets, sets of polygons that give the outer boundaries of to, to be avoided regions. Uh, typically, there's some uh, state space in which the initial position and final position are characterized here. It will be just a point, but it can be generally also a point plus an orientation or a, pain, a point plus a uh, configuration of a complex shape, like say if your vehicle has a non-trivial shape. And so uh, they define uh, mathematically then what it means to have a solution which takes your initial state to the final state without any constraint violation. Uh, so the kinds of mathematical techniques in there are solving constraint equations. So you, you know, you uh, essentially write down parametrically the path as a family of 
curves, and then uh, you have multiple constraints that uh, so parameterize the curve and have multiple constraints that allow you to determine the parameter values. Um, some of these use discretization and then search spaces in discrete form. And there are approaches that sample the continuously managed spaces. So it's like random sampling. And, and uh, so you're trying all different paths and then you make judgments on these paths and select the most highly rated paths and so on. So it's a, I, I don't want to give a detailed survey over that. So this is a whole field of its own. Um, and this local stuff with the vehicle, uh, non holonomic constraints, there's a very good book, um, Cox Vilfong. I think some chapters of that book are also online, uh, deal with these kind of problems. Um, so th that is largely considered solved, I would say. So this right in the 90s, I think that's uh, solved. And it's again, it's, it's based on polygonal models of surfaces. And uh, you know that is really what then in practice people do. For instance, when you have an autonomous parking device, um, then what you do is try to use your, your um, distance sensor and um, maybe vision or camera perhaps, and then construct a model like that. Or your distance sensor, for instance, might just give you a few uh, discrete distance uh, numbers. As some of you might have cars where there are these assistants and you see a little outline of how far you are from any obstacle. And then you see it's just some point measures. But you can uh, adjust the parameters of a obstacle outline model and then use that like a rectangle that you fit around these distance sensors to give a polygonal representation of the boundary. And then your planner is based on that. You know, that's the, the, the spirit in which this is used. Uh, when, you, when you do the local path planning, smoothness constraints are important. That is, you don't want to make very, very abrupt maneuvers because that might be, make it very difficult to control to actually bring that about, apart from being maybe uncomfortable for passengers. So again, I'm not going to go deeper into that. Now let's let's look at the potential field approach. That's the closest in spirit to the text dynamics approach, and it is very commonly used as an, a talk approach, a heuristic approach at the local reactive level. But first I'll talk about it as a really as a planning approach. It was invented, I think, by Katib in the 80s. Um, I think he's really known to be the inventor of it. And uh, there's a uh, somewhat related approach uh, that uh, Neville Hogan developed at around the same time that is framed a bit different. It's about impedance control. It's something that I'm interested in in the motor area. A human human movement area. Um, it's a complicated relationship between these approaches, uh, but um, Katib is certainly the one that in robot planning is, is the, the, the more commonly referred, uh, re referenced one. And so the idea is simply that you introduce a potential field, let's say in the case of 2D motion planning, the field would be just as a number defined for every position in the plane. And you can extend that to a high dimension space. And, um, and so that number would, um, is, is modeled uh, to be a smooth function, differentiable function of position. And the idea is that you would uh, express the constraints by the shape of that function. So for instance, areas that you want to avoid would be hills and areas that you want to achieve where you want to go are minima or that little bit you know, downhill. Uh, yeah, you would need more than 3D if you want to uh, do this in joint space, for instance. And I'll show you an example without explaining. In configuration space, you have a, uh, let's say, seven, seven uh, joint angles, and then you could try to express constraints about joint configurations that don't collide with the environment by um, defining a seven dimension, a field over seven dimensions. That is actually done in some. Um, uh, manipulator planner. So this belongs into the second part of the, the course. I haven't really explained that. Um, so uh, there are approaches that do it exactly the opposite way. So it's a question whether you take the potential plus or minus, right? It's, it's just a matter of convention. In physics, we typically talk about going downhill. So we take go along the negative gradient. Uh, and I'm using that picture, but there are some people in the literature who did it the other way around, uh, where you go to to maxima and you avoid the minima, right? So it's just a question of convention. Uh, 
So here I've been talking about a case where you're always going downhill. And therefore, you're avoiding uh, the obstacles are hills and the minima are valleys. Uh, <clears throat> so to, to make this, um, so heuristic, yes, you will see in a moment, it's certainly not exact because there are well-known problems where the constraints are violated. Um, so to do that, what you need is, of course, some uh, representation of these constraints of what the target and obstacle uh, states are. Let's say in 2D would be locations, perhaps, of the vehicle. And, um, and so in the standard approach, uh, you build the potential from building blocks, just like we built the attract dynamics approach from four slats and from elementary contributions. So for instance, uh, around an obstacle, you could have a, a, you know, a little uh, potential contribution like that, that you add that has limited range. You see, uh, if you go beyond these areas, the obstacle isn't failed. You could have a Gaussian, you know, the example that you saw in the Fajian paper is it's of uh, a Gaussian uh, kernel, so a roundish kernel that has some kind of shape. Um, and similar for uh, the target. Um, and the once you have that, you have to have some, so you then typically you're superposing all these constraints and then you're uh, just have some procedure of generating the path from that by going downhill. And uh, I wanted to, yeah, uh, see a chat question. Um, so this is the potential field approach does not use a grid. There's a question if this is a, it's a grid. Uh, no, it's uh, it's including continuous space. It is in a sense it's what I called symbolic in my uh, track dynamics lectures. As you would assume that you know particular objects in the world that you consider obstacles or target locations, and that you then erect these contributions around those different area. So the example I show you now is like that. Now there is also a reactive use where you just take sensory information, express it in, in uh, fields like that. Um, I will show uh, something that's sort of closer to that, but it actually still is sort of based on a concept of adding uh, contributions to the potential around states, estimated states that you want to avoid or want to go to. So in that sense, it's always symbolic, I would say. Yeah, it's, it's always adding discrete cont uh, contributions. It's not like every sensor reading adds the potential. Actually, interesting point, by the way. And could be elaborated a little bit. Okay, so that's you build the potential from contributions like that. So just sum it up typically. And then you uh, compute the path by going downhill in that potential. There are different proposals how to go downhill. You know, if you just go along the gradient and sometimes there are rules that you go down the gradient, but with some kind of inertia that is you don't turn too abruptly, you have some, some, um, uh, some it's a dynamics essentially of how you uh, go down the gradient so that you smooth the turns. That's the most commonly used approach because the, you will see in the moment that the uh, gradient direction can change quite abruptly and the vehicle will be navigating in a very abrupt way, which is not so nice. These are all heuristic. Um, there's no guarantee that they work. And uh, the, in fact, you have the same problem you have in the attractive dynamic approach that when you add the constraints, it's not clear that they are, uh, that you know the superposed potential will fulfill all the constraints. We'll look at a subtle problem in a moment but even so now I can say, you know, you could have, let's say in the extreme case, you would have that the um, target, you know, is like an inverse shape, is like a minimum like that. And you could see, let's say it has same function form or similar function form. If you had a obstacle exactly where you have a target I have or very close, they would cancel, right? When one goes up, the other goes down, would cancel. So you can see that that, that wouldn't be uh, very nice. So, so as such, it's always heuristic, that approach. Now, as I mentioned, you can make it exact by not just building the potential from a talk building blocks that you combine, but, but, but by computing it as a solution of some 
optimality principle where you say, I want to find the function that smoothly varies between maxima that I fix at certain locations that are obstacles and minima that I fix that are my targets. And then, you know, do something that is smooth in between that doesn't have any other maxima or minima. And so for instance, Poisson equation has this property that you can mathematically prove that it has maxima only where there are the charges in the electrical metaphor, uh, positive charge, negative charges uh, would be the maxima and minima. Um, th those some variants of that are exact approaches, and you know, again, it's very painful to compute that poten that equation. The solution of that equation, especially if the sensor information changes every time step. So here, here an example from the textbook. This is from maybe a paper, but the textbook also reviews that. I don't remember exactly. And so here, uh, this is using potential approach as a planning approach, not as a control reactive approach. So here would be an example of obstacle configurations. Um, some of which are polygonal. This one would be a curved trajectory. It just shows that you can deal with that that you have given somehow. And then your the idea would be you erect now the obstacle contribution. And this would be a case where you're doing this by uh, uh, computing contour lines. That is, you go as an algorithm that does that, you know, that goes away from the surface and makes the level of the potential function of distance from the surface. And then you have to uh, find a rule of when you have distances from two surfaces, how to compute the level that the potential has there. And you can imagine that you can make certain kinds of rules about that where the same distance, that the shorter distance counts for the level and so on. And uh, similarly, you could erect the uh, target field. So here is the target location. And this is a case where it is not even circular. It's a piecewise, uh, uh, the, uh, a square piecewise linear. So these are kind of the contour lines that you would uh, erect here and with some special tricks about how to deal with these surfaces. And then you superpose those, um, and there is some um, detailed stuff that just shows you in the, the nature of these things that they add uh, certain bubbles around obstacles to avoid awkward things at edges. Uh, and this is now still showing the control lines. And so you can sort of guess what solutions are here you want to go, and you can see that you would be going downhill here. And maybe you can see here there's a bifurcation point where somewhere here you would go this way and somewhere here you will go around that way. Uh, one can see all of those. Uh, so that's sort of the nitty gritty of, of how these things are done. And here's an example of a rather complex uh, problem, uh, a non-point like robot. So a, point, a robot with finite extension that through a complicated gradient descent that I'm not explaining uh, exactly finds a complex operational procedure, right? It has to uh, go through this and then turn and, you know, and then again, reorient to make the next turn and so on. So something rather co complex looking can be derived from a potential like that. I'm not explaining here exactly how. Now you can get maybe a sense for that, right? So that's one area. This has been generalized as also like the 80s, shortly after Kati proposed this to um, complex higher dimensional uh, planning tasks. This as, answers perhaps a question that was asked earlier. This is still a 2D robot arm. This is actually a caricature of a robot arm that is both a vehicle and an arm. It can move around and extend. And it um, can here fi find here a solution how this arm unfolds to reach through an opening and then reach around. Right? It's just a demonstration that you can do that. And so what this does is translates these constraints in space into configuration space that is computes for every possible configuration of these, I don't know, seven, eight joints that this uh, 2D arm has um, a potential level that tells you know, in which direction you want to move away from that configuration. Again, I'm not, not explaining the detail. So th this has been developed in the 80s. I don't think it has been really used in this style very much because it's, it's not very practical. Uh, the way it's been used much more is um, in the reactive sense. I'll, I'll come to that. Now let's look at this example that you, you read the paper off. This is how Fajin and Warren uh, 
um, model the obstacle avoidance uh, of humans using potential field approach, and they compare the potential field approach to the attractor dynamic approach, as you might remember, and they actually argued that the potential field approach didn't lend itself so well to fitting the trajectories. And they made a few points about that that I find interesting. So it's, a, again, a, a approach that a heuristic, you see here that, that this potential is built from two kinds of contributions. There is the target contribution, which makes that overall there is this sort of slope going down here. So the target would be somewhere here. Um, globally would go down in this direction. And then these individual maxima are obstacles and they have a parameters like uh, how steep this onset is and how thick they are. There's you know, how, how much area you really want to avoid of the obstacles, a point-like or somewhat extended. And they systematically vary these parameters and compare that then to the consequences. <clears throat> so here, for instance, uh, there would be some initial an agent of a certain size, some initial uh, uh, position going to the, the goal. And you can see how, depending on how you vary these parameters, how you specify them, this uh, robot uh, would uh, either get very close to the obstacle, so not make very strong avoidance, or uh, make these rather strong avoidance uh, procedures. So for instance, approaching this uh, obstacle and then turning quite abruptly, you have to think of the vehicle being on top of this path, right? So you see, oops, so you see the, the vehicle would have come quite close to the point like obstacle here. And similarly here, when it um, moves, uh, you know, he avoids here the next one and so on. So this is one of the arguments that you very easily get uh, obtain trajectories that are too uh, unsmooth, that are not realistic in terms of what humans do. And the two parameters that you play with is how, what's this core area that you want to avoid and how far from the obstacle do you start to notice this in influence. You can see that the it's not um, totally free. You're not totally free to vary that because if you extend the range over which an obstacle um, is effective um, too much, then you might very easily, quickly not find any way through obstacles anymore which is unrealistic because people may, may be able to walk through that. And if you make it very small, then you might have this very abrupt behavior. So they systematically vary that. So here's an example where, actually, I don't remember the details of these uh, curves, but uh, I think what they varied was the distance dependence of uh, repulsion in the attractor dynamics approach to the shape of the potential. So here's an example where the potential is sharper than the distance dependent and uh, the point of that is that there's a very abrupt transition from um, not avoiding the obstacle very well to then a very abrupt um, uh, maneuver to avoid the obstacle. And that was considered a bad approximation to human pass. And then the other case uh, where the um, obstacle was broader than the uh, distance dependent of the attractive dynamic approach. And then uh, I believe uh, something similar happened that is the paths that were smooth were uh, had a collision condition. So here's collision, right? If you're moving this vehicle along these paths, you're colliding. And, uh, and so the, the correct path, again, is very abrupt. It's not, not good. So that's what they rejected as being unrealistic. Here's an illustration of the spurs attractor approach, which they also demonstrated. Uh, the spurs attractor approach arises and um, when you have a goal, you're, you're, you're at a position, you have a goal, and there are obstacles in between. So if the generic situation, in fact, you know, obstacles are really only an issue if they are between you and your goal, right? If they are on the side or somewhere off, they don't matter much. So in a sense, that is the generic situation, right? And this illustrates that uh, you often get some kind of minimum here. Uh, it's only visible here because the fact that the path you know, turns around here. Uh, and if the very, you know, you can avoid it by making these uh, things not repulsive enough, and then you collide, you go through. Uh, and this would be perhaps a correct path that avoids the, the whole uh, um, area. And uh, the, um, you know, the, the reason why this arises is that you have a global downhill tendency from the initial position to the goal. So it's like a big, big, 
valley was going downhill to the goal here. And you have to have that goal to be a global kind of valley because you want to reach the goal from anywhere, right? So it has to be very global in sense. It's not very local. Um, and then you have these obstacles which have a more local repulsion, you know, more local uh, maximum uh, set. And uh, if you think of that geographically, you know, you could think it's like a big mountain valley going downhill, and then you have a little little hills here, and then in front of these hills, a lake is going to form if it's in the mountains. That is this local minimum, right? Because it goes downhill from these and downhill from that, and so they cancel here and make a minimum. And if it's arranged correctly, then it it uh, it really there is no no escape so you can really get there's a, a true minimum in here so th these are called spurs attractors because they are minima that were not planned for and the minima are you know mathematically speaking they are attractors um, and they um they were they're not, not constraints you want to impose and, and therefore this is not a correct solution you're not reaching the target <clears throat> Yeah, actually, I don't you know. I, I don't know exactly what path two is. I uh, don't remember exactly. I think the parameter values were different. I don't remember exactly what's different about path two. Sorry about that. To go back to the paper, you have this paper. You can maybe find out yourself. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, in a way, this is a um, a generic thing. It very easily happens. It's well known that this is a generic property of the uh, potential field approach. A lot of uh, implementations of this approach um, encounter that problem. And so the state of the art is actually that the potential field approaches that are used in the periphery as reactive approaches have ad hoc solutions to this. The solution uh, typically consists of um, detecting that you're in a spurious minimum uh, which, uh, for instance, by keeping integrating and noticing that you're not that you sort of move, staying in a certain area, that you're not moving, that your distance to your obstacle doesn't really decrease, and then they have ad hoc solutions, for instance, to uh, retrace your steps or to add a other repulsive force somewhere or certain, certain kinds of ad hoc solutions. So, for instance, in some of the vacuum cleaners, there are little algorithms like that. So it's maybe interesting to realize that the attract dynamics approach doesn't have that problem. You know, there are constraints violations possible in the attract dynamics approach, which we discussed a little bit. There could be cancellations that one obstacle pushes you in one direction uh, and the other in another, and an attractor could arise between them if the votes aren't right. Um, and so that would lead to collision rather than like more like this part two, rather than to um, getting stuck like that. There is no possibility to get stuck like that. So this generic problem is not one that arises and that comes really from the fact that we're planning velocities and so there's no um, corresponding, uh, <clears throat> even it's not possible to express that in the dynamic approach. Um, also notice, you know, when I say the attractor is at the goal, the, you know, see, see what the difference is between the attack dynamics approach and the potential field approach. In the uh, potential field approach, the movement, the plan is the transient solution to the attractor. And, 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 and so you could say, as an, you could think of the attractor, the, the potential field approach as being a, an attractor dynamics approach, but then it's only the end state that is the behavior. So we, I sometimes say it's a, it's a model of posture, of staying in a particular location, which might not be totally stupid. You, you, maybe you want to control a drone that's positioned over something, has various influences, and, and you just keep it there. And then if you move around some ops, Objects, you know, maybe the drone adjusts its position to keep its distance from certain points. But it's not an attractor dynamics approach of the movement that there. In the attractor dynamics approach that we discussed, by using velocity variables, we can make that these variables are in an attractor state all the time while the system is actually moving in the environment, right? This is a different order uh, of derivative, it makes it possible to use the attractors while generating the behavior. And as I argued, then you have to make sure that the constraints are, by, uh, are satisfied by the attractor states rather than by all the transient solutions. Well, in the potential field approach, 
you have to make sure that the constraints are satisfied by all transient solutions, not just by the attractor states, which is more demanding. That's where this problem arises. Yeah. Um, and here, this just summarizes things that were discussed. This is this exact approach that I hinted at that doesn't have that problem with spurs attractors. Good. So much about the potential field approach. It is uh, quite commonly being used still today. The virtual force field approach is uh, historically interesting. Uh, these are the authors who invented it originally. It actually has two components. One has to do with something like SLAM, and the other has really to do with the attractor dynamics approach that I, I mentioned. To my knowledge, it's not used in this specific form, but variants that are sort of like that have been used. Um, it comes actually originally from the problem of ultrasound. And I'll get to that in a moment, using ultrasound sensor, no longer really so topical. Um, and that gives rise to uh, this vector uh, histogram uh, concept. Um, let, let's may first look at the path planning itself. So uh, the idea in this approach is that you're generating a representation of the environment. So we could really think of it as a neural representation uh, from which you then compute the path. So for instance, if you're sonar uh, sensor sends out a beam in this direction and gets some echo from an object there, it will enter uh, a um, estimate that there's an obstacle there into a grid, for instance, centered on its current uh, sensor cone in the center of that. And it will keep doing that as the vehicle moves and rescans the environment, it will keep doing that. And therefore, as you, for instance, if you move through that, certain uh, grid cells will uh, multiple times uh, receive an entry as an estimate that there must be uh, a surface there. Um, so that's sort of building a map. Uh, it is building a map really in a slam sense because you, to enter the sensory information into this grid, you need to know where the vehicle is relative to that grid. You need to know that is the pixel I want to enter the sensor signal now, and then maybe you know this one is the one when, which I want to enter into uh, later. Uh, so it's based on, on uh, integrating path integration on, on deri you know, deriving from the motor commands you send to your vehicle an estimate of where you are in the world. This is not slam because this it just presumes that you know the echo position, so you're not actually updating your estimate of the echo position based on the map. You're just having an ad hoc procedure over a longer time. This becomes imprecise. In this case, it, it wasn't supposed to be working over a longer time. It's still used just for a reactive approach to do control uh, vehicle motion. The reason why uh, Bornstein and Korn uh, did this was that sonar is not a very reliable sensor. So you need to accumulate sensor readings across multiple measurements and multiple positions to extract from it relevant information about the world. And sonar is not a good sensor among many, for many reasons. You see that uh, like, like the light reflecting uh, diodes that we had, um, or, or you know, diodes sensing reflected light. Uh, and the, the, this uh, senses reflected sound and that sound can arise irrespective of where in the sensor cone the object is. So only by um, look, looking at scans from different uh, positions can you get some kind of estimate of where within the cone that is. For instance, you see that this is now the area where these readings accumulate. And that gives you a little bit better information about that object. But the more fundamental reason is actually that the sonar signals only give a reflection when the surface that the sound is reflected from is um, at the right angle, at an angle that uh, is, uh, you know, reflects sound. Uh, this was before radar and leader. Yeah, absolutely. This end is also very, very cheap. So it's, it's still somehow, somewhat attractive, but it's sort of fallen out of fashion now because um, not actually, radar and leader are still, uh, you know, quite expensive. But, uh, and radar has all kinds of problems, by the way, um, <clears throat> somewhat similar problems. But um, 
yeah, I, I would say that it's just the drive to use better sensors has been strong and people use vision as well. You can do much more with vision now. So this has fallen out of favor. Uh, it's still being used sometimes in very low level kind of devices. But the concept actually has been used, this kind of concept of accumulating sensor information that is being used also by these more modern sensors. So that's why I think it's worth understanding what the logic of that is, because they're all essentially doing that. They're accumulating sensor information across multiple readings and doing something like that. They don't always do this just based on frequency itself. Sometimes, you know, there are more sophisticated probabilistic approaches. You could think of this entering the certainty values is like a, a way to construct now a, a Bayesian probability estimation and Bayesian in a sense like some kind of belief representation. It's not a strictly frequentist picture, perhaps it's, it's some kind of accumulation of beliefs. Yeah, so as a result of that, you will have after some time um, a, a map where you on this grids you have um, certain areas from which you um, uh, where, you know, where, where you have good, uh, you think there's a like, likelihood of collision there. And so then, um, but the uh, goal of Korn, Bunch and Korn was to, to de come up with a navigational approach uh, that then finds a path through these kind of readings. And so it's an interesting thing. It's sort of like the tractor dynamics approach, uh, except it's not really dynamic. So what it did was it uh, transformed this grid representation into an angular representation. So if you pick a particular location, then you look in which direction do I find entries into this map and you actually uh, rate them also with a distance. So if the distance to the object here is large, then uh, it uh, contributes less to this angular histogram than if it's small. Um, and um, yeah, that's what it is. And, and then you have the vector that points in the direction of the target. And so they had a, um, uh, a talk algorithm where they were essentially trying to find an angular direction that is free, where there is a minimal repulsive vectors, and that is the closest possible to the target direction. And then they would be moving in that direction. So it's just an algorithm is heuristically defined, but you could think of it as sort of a dynamic systems approach in the sense that that direction where there is little reading and that is just the target that would be what corresponds to the attractor, right? They don't do it dynamically. That is, this could jump this value and then they would really turn sharply to the other direction. So it's not really doing this as a dynamical system. And it's also just, um, Finding a free path is not really based on uh, gradually changing your heading direction, but it's sort of conceptually somewhat related, right? That's why I mentioned it. Uh, and, and sort of an approach like that is actually not in this exact form, but uh, sort of heuristic programming rules like that are included in, uh, for instance, a couple of the vacuum cleaners. And some of this stuff is only documented, uh, no, not public, but known from people who work there, we roughly know these sort of ideas. Um, there is an interesting problem, the oscillation, oscillatory problem that we also saw in the attractive dynamics approach. You, know, you can see that when um, the uh, environment is, is closed, then you can get um, that the direction that is free jumps around. And, and when that jumps around, then you get this kind of oscillatory behavior. And that is something that it also happens to the academic approach sometimes when your left and right sensors are just um, around threshold. You know, they, they can sense only from a certain distance on if you're close enough. And then if you move away, they don't sense. And then you might be pushed again to that wall. Then again, you sense and you go away and then you lose it again and go and so on. So you can have these kind of destinations. Essentially the same kind of origin of the problem. It's ultimately all just limitations of the sensors. Um, the other part of that program was uh, for them to really build these maps. And so here's an example of how uh, in the world you would have these certainty maps and then you sample it in polar terms to determine the, the path. So here, for instance, this, this would be entries into that map that have been accumulated from past experiences and uh, reflecting this environment. And then the vehicle would be actually able maybe to 
path you know, to a plan. So this is from a, a lab experiment that demonstrates that they did have a um, approach, uh, some products that they developed from that. So one uh, famous one was a kind of a, a walking stick for the blind. It was a little robot vehicle uh, that was connected to a stick and that vehicle would be navigating in front of the person walking based on an approach like that. And so the blind person just had to follow that uh, active uh, stick to, and it would go around uh, obstacles that way. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not sure it ever had any success, but it, it was very popular for a while. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to go through more details of that. It's sort of the sense of the spirit of that, right? So I would say conceptually, it's kind of consistent with the dynamic systems approach because it's using this in angular space and angular space would be sort of like velocity on the uh, heading direction, velocity and torque like that. And rather than, you know, again, attack dynamics, they just find open areas, minima, you know, in these histograms, they're finding the areas where there is enough free space. And so there's some ad hoc uh, algorithmic rules to select. There would be two attractors here, right? This one and that one. They have some uh, ad hoc way of how to select uh, the, the one they, they choose. <clears throat> yeah, it works. That's sort of perhaps decent. Now, uh, the an approach that is quite the, the this version of the uh, that I'll now talk about now. This version of the attractor dynamic approach, uh, the the potential field approach. Uh, is actually the version that is often in these vehicles, uh, like some of the simple vehicles that you can buy or others vacuum cleaners. Uh, and so that can be a little bit more complex. Uh, it's behavior based and it's more complex because they were using different kinds of contributions to the potential to generate different elementary functions. So uh, Arkin has implemented in all different kind of uh, settings, this is older work and uh, Ron Arkin actually, who's behind this program has uh, since done a lot of work, but it's not published because it's all military. Mm -hmm. So he's apparently really involved with the army developing autonomous vehicles uh, for war kind of situations. A very, uh, you know, it's like good application because in the war scenario, you know, uh, battlefield scenario, uh, you have a good reason why you don't want to have a driver in there and uh, you know, have rough terrain, uh, you can't just follow roads, uh, it's, uh, it's not by traffic rules and so on. So it's like for robotics, it's like an ideal environment. For research, it's, well, it's not so nice to go off the constraints of that kind of work. And some people don't like uh, working on weapons. Um, no, you know, it can be for, it depends on for how, you know, who uses them for what. Still, um, it's not so common uh, in Germany, we don't, don't uh, do that kind of work much. Uh, I just want to give you some ideas of that. Um, so, um, so, so one thing I want to say is typical uh, use of potential field approach is hinted at here. So this is for the Arkin approach where he calls these things schema. You'll see in a moment, they're a little bit more general. But down here, that will be the potential field approach system. So that has uh, acts directly on the motors and gets some sensor information that um, invokes these schemata and has this, what he calls schema control is essentially an algorithm that uh, works in the, in the potential field domain and finds the downhill path that is consistent with the constraints. And then on top, he would have, um, you know, a de deliberate planner that would have much more where you might have even a mission, a mission and a spatial reason and then the sequencer that makes different steps. And uh, that would set goals for these uh, schema controllers and uh, perception information is used to build the world representation on which this is acted. Uh, so, and this would be uh, more strategic also in the sense that it sends, sets target on larger time scale. So, intermittently sets targets for this lower level, while this one works at that iterative step of how you acquire sensor information. Um, yeah, and I, I don't want to go into all the details. So one idea is that you have discrete different sch uh, schemata, actually, in the moment. They, they say schema, 
in law, it will be schemata in German, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> and each uh, it could, it has its own sensory channel. Um, so they're not using a world representation for that, right? It's really behavior based. And then these different schemata vote for whatever they uh, consider to be a, a good uh, outcome. And you see they're very typically, uh, it's actually then transformed into a current heading direction. So they're again using, uh, ultimately at the lowest level, they're using some kind of a check that I mean, kind of idea, even though it is the schemata, as you will see, are potential fields of schemata. Um, yeah, that's that's the reactive component. Uh, so the kind of schemata they have go beyond just going toward a target of an obstacles. They have you know, like path following. The, this would be uh, going straight, <laughs> for instance, uh, going uh, to the goal would be the one that we have looked at of an obstacle, but also uh, like little react like reflexes like. Uh, avoiding you can see the military context here uh, dodging avoiding something uh, some random search going away from areas you've just been to to explore uh, you know moving in open directions so much less go directions so you can explore better docking is when you're also uh, trying to control the angle at which you approach the surface and then you have to, uh, remote control by a human operator and so here are examples of the kind of schemata, how they actually translate into force fields, right? For instance, here you have a, uh, just a goal force field. This would be an obstacle force field, a potential force field meaning the derivative of the potential, right? I mean, that's expressed as force field. Here you can see this is something that keeps you on a path like that, avoids collision with the walls. Uh, this is like a, a wedge where you would be avoiding moving away from that direction and moving away like a, a, a fault, a, cl a cliff or so you don't want to approach and so on. So they have all, a whole bunch of different things like that. So typically they, again, just superpose these different potential contributions. So the constraint combination is not particularly intelligent or anything like that. And um, therefore things have to be tuned so that the resulting solution will satisfy all the constraints. And that's heuristic, that's not, not always exact. And actually Arkin is one of those who have developed diagnostic software where the system notices that constraints are violated and then changes the parameters of some of these contributions to you know, popping up the constraint that is violated to give it a larger weight to adjust the solution. So here, for instance, you're moving along a path, avoiding obstacles, going to a goal, you see the it pushes you quite close to this obstacle, for instance. That's something that maybe you have to work on. And that's really good because it lies right in the path of the uh, goal attraction. And you can even do uh, uh, sequences this way. It's uh, what we would call chaining. So it's certainly somewhat rigid. So for instance, uh, this would be a sequence planner where you first try to find trash and then drop it into a trash can. And you see when you start, you you are essentially looking for trash and you have a bumper in front uh, that allows you to detect trash. So if you find trash, you move in the direction of the trash in a loop until you um, are, you know, your bumper tells you that it's really uh, close or in front of the vehicle and then you grab it and then you go to, actually you move back <clears throat> and then you look for the trash can. I don't know exactly how it does that, what kind of sensor it uses for that. And it's similar. Keep moving to the trash can once detected. And um, you no, know, then you drop the trash and turn back and restart looking for trash, right? <laughs> so there was a whole uh, period where people were proposing these kind of things. This is actually still going on. There is a group in Kaiserslautern who uh, builds architectures like that that are you know, enormously complex. I used to have that in my lectures. Uh, so you can't even um, plot it. It would be a hierarchically organized uh, where you try to, through these kind of behavioral um, sequence or reflexive, you know, because always one, a signal that you pick up that switches you from one node to the next. And it has some implicit dynamic loops. There could be things that uh, you know, are recurrent, so there's no guarantee you, you could get stuck in some of those. Um, 
And so then the sequential behavior would emerge from that. So it's, sort of, it's not exactly programming because you, the sequence really at every moment in time is subject to sensor readings that could be internal or external. So it's very reactive. Uh, but the kinds of path they can take are implicit in the architecture. So in that sense, it's quite fixed. Yeah, so th those are the most important comparisons I want to make. So it's really this kind of potential field approach as a reactive approach, you know, where you have a talk uh, entries to the dynamics. That's sort of the state of the art. I believe that that could be for the for the reactive planner, I think it could always be replaced by uh, attractive dynamics. <clears throat> it's just not done because most of the people in that field just know this, and, and it's not considered really critical, so they just use this. <clears throat> and there's one interesting approach that's a little bit apart. Uh, it's also more than twenty years old. Um, by, by the three German uh, roboticists who had major impact, Sebastian Thun, as you, some of you might know, is the person who ended up winning, winning one of those DARPA challenges for autonomous driving. Uh, Burkhardt is in Freiburg, very influential roboticist, in, and Dieter Fox is uh, also now in the US, a uh, leading person on vision for robots. Um, very successful people. And I think this was like maybe a student project or so, I don't know exactly, where they had this very cool little approach, also a totally ad hoc approach that was copied a couple of times by others because it makes uh, these robots able to drive relatively fast. And it's an interesting way of how they take into account um, dynamic constraints on the vehicle. Again, it's totally ad hoc as an algorithm. And so it's I kind of want to explain some highlights of it. It's probably in the details is, is some of the work. Um, but it could be easily transformed into a attractive dynamics approach. Uh, see what ha has happened is very much that this level of path planning has great theory behind it, and then some stuff works, most of the potential field approach, reasonably well, and people have moved on to the other more challenging problems, the slam problem and uh, perception problems, and then doing more than just action. And um, and so academic work on this is no longer really so active. I have also moved out of this area. <laughs> uh, while the, when the robots are actually being deployed, like now a lot of these vacuum cleaners and other uh, very simple um, household robots like the uh, wet wiping robots and um, you know, lawn mowers and, and some agriculture robots and so on. And so what happens is that their path plan is sort of a, using all the tools that are around and it's, um, sort of fine-tuned and sort of somewhat ad hoc assembly of those things using essentially algorithms that combine these things in various ways. So it's, it's become a mess and these things are optimized by engineers to do something well and it's no longer really so attractive and so interesting to uh, make sweeping theories about those things, um, even though these theories might really be effective. Similar things happen in control where, you know, the robot companies have developed uh, good approach to control. They're consistent with the general principles that the exact details are proprietary and they're quite good. And it's sort of as an academic kind of a, a painful area because it's difficult to beat those robots, but uh, not very well published how they work. And it's a kludge of many different kinds of things. So it's a little bit of a messy area which often happens when things get into deployment. So this, this is a very charming idea. That's why I want to present it. So the idea was to get these robots uh, to move fast. So again, this was a robot at the time that worked with, with uh, sonar information, and therefore it had to uh, integrate over time to, to get information about the environment. So the idea was that they would um, use velocity as a representation you know, close to us. So they had two components of velocity. One is the linear velocity, which is plotted here in along this axis, and the other is the angular velocity. So uh, plotted here to the left and to the right. And so that um, amounts to piecewise circular trajectories, a constant um, 
the constant omega you're making sort of a piece, piece little piece of a circle uh, and and what so what they did is that they made a search for pieces of uh, velocity and omega you know angular and linear velocity trajectory um, and the the search entails uh, constraints from the environment like collision you know doors through which you want to go and so on. Uh, so you have to translate sensor readings about distance primarily into uh, surfaces in the velocity space. And that's based on uh, principles like these. So you need to have some assumption about the um, uh, trajectories of the robots to translate the velocities uh, the, the distance measurements into a velocity, right? If you have a velocity uh, mo a path model, then you can say a wall at that distance gives me a, uh, a, a range of velocities that will avoid collision with that surface, for instance. And so that's only approximately true. That's why it's a heuristic approach. Uh, and so, so that is how you they translated. Um, um, uh, collision constraints into limits on the velocities. And, um, and this is based on uh, taking the distance and then computing um, the velocity at which the remaining time to collision with that um, surface was below a threshold, which they uh, you know, is a characteristic of the robot that is, could it be breaking, reducing velocity to zero before that, uh, that time? So, so you know how uh, particular speed, you know, I have a lookup table for uh, how much time until I'm, I've, uh, I've break to zero. And if you have a certain distance, you have to integrate that at a certain distance. And you can say, um, at which velocity can I still stop in front of that? Uh, surface. And so based on that, they were able to compute, uh, again, with some ad hoc assumptions, these boundaries in the velocity space, uh, such that when you stay away from those boundaries, you can stop before any of these detected surfaces. And this becomes a strictly a difficult problem uh, if you exchange, you know, apply that to all velocities. So what you do is you limit the time horizon, and that's based on the fact that you're also only having local measurements, so you don't want to move too far. Um, so, because then you don't know after moving what your sensor readings will be. Uh, so they defined, uh, again, heuristically a, a window um, where these all these computations can be done. And that's a window that um, is moving with a vehicle and that is characterized by a certain time interval in which you make this computation. Uh, so the exact equations for that are a clue of all kinds of things. So in the papers, you find a few limit cases and the whole thing is just one big algorithm. So here's an example of a little window that would be relevant at some point in time. So when you're at that velocity, you will be looking uh, at a range of velocities that you might choose next. And uh, that takes into account sensor readings that you had. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the more detailed variants of that, and it's not really so important, it's just that they have some ad hoc functions, uh, cost functions essentially, for different uh, aspects, uh, like wanting to always have the maximum velocity, wanting to keep certain safe distances, and wanting to move in the direction of the target. So it's a little bit like our second order approach that I reviewed. It has that same sort of spirit. Um, and, um, and they were able to also put in here, I don't remember exactly where that is, uh, maximum accelerations and decelerations the vehicle can have. Uh, you can put that in these cost functions. So for instance, um, under some conditions, you would get this kind of cost function where there would be um, you know, particular translation velocities and rotational velocities that are uh, uh, have high cost. Uh, I think here, high cost is actually good. So the maximum, I think you're going for the maximum. Yeah, and so you would be going for these maximal values that 
based on whether they take you in the direction of the target and whether they have, I think this is just for target, by the way. And then there is some uh, keeping distance from surfaces uh, cost function and then superposition of those will give you the correct function. I think this is the superposition of those and they do some smoothness because this varies very strongly. And they're just always taking them the local maximum. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so for instance, in, in these uh, two windows, there's really only limited part of the environment that affects the system. I don't remember now exactly uh, what, what actually is plotted here. So you're always finding the local, local maximum of those things in discrete steps in time. And so here's an example of this um, system moving around here. You see, it would only have uh, sketchy environmental information because its sonars will get some signal from a few, is hinting here, from a few uh, spots in the environment. The angle is a function of distance because there's a special angular cone and um, something that's far is, of course, a larger segment of surface that this is informative about when something is close. And uh, the system may also have some map information. And uh, so each of those constraints is used to make an entry into this distance map. And uh, here's an example where in their building, the robot was to go, supposed to go through that opening and they varied uh, some of the parameters of what the desired speed was and sort of at the highest speed here, this speed, the robot cannot turn in, in time to go through this surface. And uh, then at lower speeds, it can actually manage to do that. And that's how the parameters can be tuned. And so the cool, may, so it's a talk, you have to tune the parameters empirically and it's all kind of messy stuff, but it's a cool thing. This enabled this robot to move quite impressively fast based on these very simple sensors in indoors environment. And so that's how it became very famous. So ideas of like that could be used to in, include dynamic constraints. So in, I hinted when I talked about second order robot that one could elaborate that kind of system to take into account maximum accelerations or decelerations, you know, breaking to express these constraints in velocity space. Um, and we've moved a little bit in this direction, working with someone on drones where you might want to do things like that. So we haven't done more than that really just because this has become a much more applied area. Um, so it's not worth for us to do that anymore. The analogy with humans isn't really so fund fundamental. Um, but more could be done really to make these solutions all very uh, rational and parameterized and theoretically clean. But so it was avoiding humans on a corridor and so on. Okay, so in summary, um, there are now in, two, in the 2D motion planning, there are actually very good uh, approaches. Um, the Theoretically exact approaches that have been studied in the past make strong demands on world representations. Um, and because they are computationally uh, costly, uh, they are, don't really work so well when the sensor information changes all the time, when you're updating the world representation. Uh, that's why reactive or heuristic approaches are more attractive and are really what is being used most of the time, sometimes combined with deliberate planning. Uh, the attack dynamics approach is actually a quite competitive uh, approach for, uh, for such reactive system, com competitive in, in, in the sense of performing well. We look in the essay at a rather complex problem using the attack dynamics approach. Uh, it's not used more commonly really just because it's mathematically demanding for something that a lot of people solve in simpler ad hoc terms. I want to point out that deliberate planning is a much more involved field. It's a long term, you know, how you actually uh, reason about planning when you have multiple constraints to satisfy. It's not such a, uh, not so much about vehicle motion. In vehicle motion, the long term planning is ultimately then doing something like uh, Google map plans, you know, finding trajectories with via points in there, uses actually some of the mathematical uh, method methodology. But this is an issue when you have robots that do more than just navigate that uh, achieve tasks. For instance, if you want to plan um, an action of uh, a vehicle going somewhere to pick up something and then deliver something else, uh, 
somewhere else and do that optimally, maybe with a fleet of uh, robots like Amazon does in uh, warehouses. Then you have a motion planning problem that's not just the pass in 2D, they actually move on very rigid uh, horizontal versus uh, vertical subspaces. But it's this coordination of many different constraints. You, very, you see, you quickly get into areas that are computationally uh, NP. The traveling salesman problem, as you might know, is uh, not polynomial in a computational time and, and uh, problems of this nature. So this is an interesting research area on its own. I don't cover this in this course, and there's also not really any neurally inspired thinking in this area because we actually don't understand how neural networks do planning. It's actually an interesting insight. Notes. Planning is not really well understood. We have a little bit of reinforcement learning ideas, but they are actually exactly uh, limited when it comes to planning in some depth. Multiple steps ahead, that's, that's a big problem. They're called the credit assignment problem. So um, there's not a good analogy. It's not clear how humans do that, probably much more with heuristics, like problem solving heuristics. There is very good math on algorithmic solutions to this planning. So this is a big field, uh, but primarily concerned with more advanced than just 2D motion planning. So for instance, um, if you go to a robotic conference, I think that's still true. It's a couple of years that I last looked at the statistics, but it's still true that the largest number of entries is typically in the motor motion planning area. So it's still the core of a lot of dance robotics. Yeah, I didn't want to go much deeper into these uh, more general topics because the uh, main guideline for us, of course, is to learn from the analogy to the nervous system. And here we move very far from that. Um, this closes the path planning uh, problem uh, in the lecture course for 2D. And I will be looking now at, at 3D object-oriented action reaching and so on in the rest of the course.